performance uh, was not like yours. Uh, this is the first time my shadow has ever graced the stage of a academic induction ceremony. So this is what it's like. So I was really grateful to be here. Um, I didn't really get serious about my education until graduate school. But to be honest, I, I've been a professor here for 10 years and had never known anything about Catholic Chi or OGK. Um, I know each year the faculty are given a list of eligible students, and we vote or check mark and they're, they're tabulated, and somehow it, it, it ends up this uh, ceremony. But in a little research, not much, we looked online at the websites and found out that um, Catholic Chi and OGK membership is offered to juniors and seniors in the top 10% to 35% of the class, undergraduate class. Um, that's a big deal. Um, good on you. Congratulations on acknowledging your <coughs> efforts and performance. I know you work hard. I know you work hard. Um, uh, and I want to thank you for your efforts. Um, the faculty loves serving all students, but in particular, and I think I can speak for most of us, we love to work with students who are serious about their education, and that's obviously you. Although personal achievement is noteworthy, uh, personal achievement is a means and not an ends. And um, it's the development of your mind and spirit with knowledge and skills that you can act. And you know, only need to look so far into the DC mission to encourage personal growth and inspire artistic, intellectual, and social action. So tonight I want to briefly talk to you about the second, and I believe the most important criteria for OK. Alpha Chi also, there's a uh, the bylaws and talk about leadership in there. But the second criteria for ODK is students who demonstrate leadership achievements in one of five campus uh, phases of campus life. So, what is a leadership achievement? Well, simply, leadership is what you do with your heart, your head, and your hands to influence others towards accomplishing a mission. Now, although it's pretty straightforward, I found, and I trust that you have too. We don't often step up and lead when our teammates need us to do so the most. And I think that's for three reasons. The first reason that I would observe why people don't lead when their leadership is needed is they believe that you must be in a position of authority. They believe they must have a title, a CEO, president, supervisor, general manager, team captain, committee chair, etc., class president. Second, I think people have a misunderstanding of what it takes to lead. I'm not smart enough, or talented enough, I'm not attractive enough, or thin enough, or tall enough. I'm not the right gender, the right ethnicity. I don't have the right personality, pedigree, or resume. Third, I think people often express hesitancy or worse anxiety over leading their peers. They fear off coming, they fear coming off bossy, or they believe leadership is about telling other people what to do or what not to do. I want to tell you these perceptions perceptions are patently false. And I want to give you three short vignettes of great leadership achievements I've experienced in my life to debunk these three myths. <clears throat> the first story, and I promise you short stories, I promise my 15 minutes, um, I call it a voice from the back of the room. So in my previous career, I was in the military, and many years ago, I was overseas uh, on a ship in the Western Pacific, and my unit, a very large unit, received a very uh, important mission. And as is customary in the military, a large staff gathers and they come up with three different courses of action or options to present to the commander so the commander can make a decision on the way to accomplish the mission. For example, option one, go in by air. Option two, go in by land. Option three, go in by sea. We did this and the courses of action were developed and the general was sitting up front the staff was facing them. It was the general, the admiral, senior officers, junior officers, all the way down to the junior enlisted. So the whole rank structure of the military in this big room. Time was of the essence. All the forces of action were presented to the general, and he was contemplating them. People were talking about the advantages and the disadvantages and trying to advocate and persuade the general one way or the other. And the general was Pretty smart guy, pretty decisive guy, but he's having trouble making a decision. Well, time was ticking. And people were starting to wring their hands a little bit. Like, come on. A voice in the back of the room. Sir, Petty Officer Jones, this is a low-ranking sailor. 
Why don't we just pick the simplest course of action and then spend our valuable time working out the details? Boom, general made a decision. Let's go with course of action number one, the staff went to work working out the plan. That young sailor was probably not 20 years old. He didn't understand the complexity of the task and the multitude of details weighing on the commander. And he didn't have any rank or authority over anybody else. But what he did that day is he served his teammates by influencing the person who could make the decision. So what I learned that day is that leadership is not about title or rank. If it was, we just had our hand out titles to everybody. You're the CEO, you're the president, you're the supervisor. Even we have a bunch of leaders, that's not the way it works. The second vignette, I call the questions the answer. About 10 years ago, I was facilitating an executive leadership development program. So I had about 15 CEOs, general managers of large companies, corporations, organizations, all very high functioning people, you know, very good at what they do. And they came to this program to learn more about communications and leadership. We were doing all these activities out in the woods, and one of them was um, we gave them an initiative where they had to construct a road bridge across a ravine. You can imagine a zip line, except it's, it's instead of zipping, it's just ropes taut between two trees. And the way the initiative works, you give them all the materials, carabiners and ropes and webbing, and then we give each individual an instruction sheet that's illustrated and has instructions on how to do one little part of that peak, of that whole system, right? But they can't show it to each other, they can just talk. So what it does is the idea is that they have to communicate and collaborate and begin to figure out how to build this thing. We set it all up. We said, okay, go. And they had limited time. And oh my gosh, what a mess. Everybody started working on their little peaks. Everybody's talking. Everybody's telling everybody else what to do. But nobody's inquiring. Nobody's asking. Nobody's questions. It was a complete mess. They get to nowhere fast. My phone started watching this. Oh my gosh, this is going horrible. I looked over, and one of the participants, a woman, I don't know, maybe 45 years old. She's obviously a CEO or president of some company, you know, big win. She kind of stepped back, stopped what she's doing, and started looking around. And she just stood there for a minute, watching all her peers just flailing. And what did she do? She got their attention. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey, listen up. What are we trying to accomplish? That's all it took. One person said, well, I'm trying to tie a knot around this tree. Another person said, well, I'm supposed to be putting a carabiner on that rope. And another person said, and they started talking to each other. And eventually they had a vision of what this thing was supposed to look like. And then they came up with a plan to get it done. That woman had no more smarts or will and talent than anybody else on the team. What she did that day was she enabled the team, she, she clarified the mission, enabled the team to come up with a vision of what they were supposed to do. What I learned that day about leadership is it's not about being boss. It's not about telling people what to do or telling them what not to do. Doling out tasks is a management function, not a leadership function. Leaderships don't boss anybody. They influence people through their words and their deeds. I learned also that sometimes leadership is expressed in the form of a compelling question, not necessarily an answer. The third vignette I titled the toilet paper I left this little asses for people falling asleep on the <laughs> In the Willie program, as many of you know, the students go on a three week, they plan a 21 day expedition. Um, they develop team goals, they figure out the transportation, logistics, supplies, food, all those things. And they go on, they can go out the top of the list for 21 days. A few years ago, I was on a trip, not the company I was on a trip with uh, 10 of my students, and about two weeks into the trip, um, one of the students said, hey, uh, gang, I just noticed we're running a little short of toilet paper. <laughs> well, next to being short of food, that's about the worst possible scenario. <laughs> okay, got it. So I started, you know, just rationing a little bit, just being careful how I'm supposed to be. You know, I have this part rule, and we'll ask this another until next week's supply. So one day we're hiking along the Appalachian Trail, um, about two weeks into the trip. We came to a road in a parking lot. And there, like the end of a rainbow, was Portageon. 
great news. Everybody took advantage of the opportunity um, and took a break. And as we were getting cleaned up and packed back up, uh, we started to take off. And one of the students said, hey, there's a brand new roll of toilet paper in that porta jug. We need it. And the group kind of wasn't much said, just kind of, like, yeah, man, go for it. You know, the students started walking over here to the toilet paper. So one of my students said, wait, that's not right. It's not a toilet paper. You know, first of all, one of our goals was we want to be self-reliant. That's not being very self-reliant. Number two is that's just not right. That's for the general public to use. That's not for us to take. <coughs> if somebody would have done that, we wouldn't have had an opportunity to use it. So it was apparent to me that what she said is absolutely probably what was on everybody's mind in the beginning. That we really shouldn't be doing this. Right? So the group got together and discussed it, had a big round table discussion about toilet paper, believe it or not. And they said, you know what, you're right. This wouldn't be right to do. Let's do it while we have, we'll, we'll make it last in the next uh, resupply. But really toilet paper would seem quite trivial, uh, but there's a larger issue at play, I think, here. Um, yeah, we had to ration toilet paper for a few days. If that woman had not the courage to speak up, we very well could have just compromised our integrity for short term personal gain. So what I learned that day is a leader doesn't need to be the brightest or the most skilled in the team. I've had plenty of leaders who are pretty ordinary, including myself. Often the leader only needs to have the courage to speak up, regardless of cost or consequences. So I want to point out three, point out that there, in, in these three stories, not one of the leaders had authority over their teammates. Not one leader had the right answer and told anybody what to do or what not to do. Not one of these leaders had more intelligence or more skill or personal talent than anybody else. But all of these three people led and they led profoundly. In closing, I would like to I would like you to accept this acknowledgement of your personal, your personal achievement, academic achievement, as a means, not an ends. I ask that you use your talents to lead others in pursuit of a worthy cause. There's a leadership theory out there called the great man theory. And the theory is this, that if you have certain characteristics, certain skill, talent, intellect, standing at the top of the hill, and you have all the right attributes, you're a great leader. Well, that theory is larger than bunk, debunk. Because although you may be the best and the brightest, if you're not using your talents to serve others and pursue a worthy cause, you're no leader. You look around the hill, behind you on the hill, nobody's following you. It's not what's in your heart and in your head, it's what you do with your talents. You don't have to be have a title or position of authority. You don't need to be the smartest or the brightest or the tallest. You don't need to be a boss or tell people what to do. You just need to have the will and the courage to influence others around you towards the mission accomplishment. It's not always easy, but it is that simple. I want to restate the BC's mission and offer a slight editing to the end to encourage personal growth and inspire artistic, intellectual, and social action in others. But don't be a spectator. I need you to lead. We need you to lead. Thank you.